Thank you, Tweet Choir. What a beautiful way to start a rainy day about agonism. I'm Ashley Duffalo, Public and Community Programs Manager at the Walker Arts Center, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to day two of the public symposium, Discourse and Discord, Architecture of Agonism from the Kitchen Table to the City Street, co-presented by northernlights.mn and the Walker Arts Center. I'd like to mention that the D&D Tweet Choir, whom you just heard, is organized by Molly Balcom Rally and Jackie Fuller of the Prairie Fire Ladies Choir. And they are our voices in residence for the symposium. They will play a very interesting role in today's program, uh, transcribing your tweets into song lyrics, which I'll let Steve Dietz tell you more about in a moment. So I'd like to welcome Steve Dietz to welcome our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. Great start, uh, both last night and this morning. Uh, my name is Steve Dietz. I'm the Artistic Director of Northern Lights. In today's partisan culture, we are all sick of the continual slash and burn rhetoric coming from every side of any issue. Yet, according to this morning's panelists, agreement is overrated. How sick is that? Agonism is the ancient Greek word for a contest with a prize. In the sense we are using it today, it is a way of understanding life and politics as a game or contest. But what does that mean in practice? Our theorist practitioners, Carl DeSalvo, Marissa John, Warren Sack, and Mark Shepard, have agreed to disagree, or at least not agree for agreement's sake about how the idea of agonism informs their approach to their practice of design, activism, computer science, architecture, and the meaning of life. Critical to their debate is not just what they believe about a particular topic, but what is the architecture, the structures, both physical and virtual, the procedures, the instruments, as Christoph reminded us last night, which can best support their agonistic approaches. This is the central question of this symposium, Discourse and Discord. Beyond the seductive, magical realism of harmony, what is the most productive way forward in an age of 24-7 antagonism? Agonism is a concept that is best enacted, and this morning is both an opportunity to play out nuanced positions and to be positioned by the lighting cues designed by Shepard after Balanchine's uh, Balanchine's uh, Ballet Agon, by the onstage word bingo developed by DeSalvo and Sack, and by John's black and blue literary foreplay, Proagonist, and by you. Throughout the conversation today, please write your tweets related to the questions marked on the back of these sheets in your programs, um, and pass them to the end of either aisle of your aisle for collection at any time during the, during the morning. Selected commentary will be used, sung by the D&D Tweet Choir as a kind of Greek discourse of your audio intertitles interpreting the morning's proceedings. Also throughout the morning, Ashley and I will be scoring the panel. Each panelist has pre-selected pre a list of words that he or she, she thinks is critical to the conversation. Every time a different panelist says one of those words, the list owner receives a point. At the end of the morning, whoever wins will buy everyone in the audience a drink ticket. <laughs> Before the games begin, I'm not going to do an informal introduction of each of the panelists' myriad accomplishments, but I do want to say a word about each and what they've meant to this proceedings. In 2003, I commissioned a work by Warren Sack along with Sawad Brooks called Translation Map for the exhibition How Latitudes Become Forms here at the Walker Art Center. Basically, I feel like I, this was a, a, a beautiful project uh, that had many different complexities with it. And in some ways, I wasn't really able to appreciate it fully at the time. And I, and, and I would say um, every couple of years, I come back to that project and learn more from it and understand more about it. And while its subject wasn't directly agonism, it was essentially when I was first introduced to the ideas of agonism and have been in my own unrigorous, unacademic way, been following Warren's rich body of practice and theory ever since. 
In some sense, on my side, this symposium is a way to better understand that project and those ideas from almost 10 years ago. So Warren, I'm not saying it's all your fault, but there's something about returning to the scene of the crime. Mark is another artist whose work I've curated in various contexts, and I still remember talking to him in San Jose about the failed city Wi-Fi system that we had promised, promised would be robustly available for his prescient Soundgarden toolkit. I believe he spent most of the festival providing IT support for the city of San Jose. Last night he told me he was presenting an Android version of the project in Serbia in a few weeks and how easy that whole, the whole infrastructure part of things is now. In fact, he may be programming it right now as he sits there. But now, besides his IT support function, Mark is an amazing cross-disciplinary thinker who I always go to for insight and advice no matter what project I'm working on. His Sentient City exhibition was groundbreaking, and if you ever get a chance to read his essay for the catalog, it is one of the best overviews available of the historical, theoretical, and speculative ideas of the smart city. I don't have a long history of working with Marissa, which is probably why I'm still standing. It seems like only days ago that we met to talk about agonism, and over the course of a single bowl of noodles, I had an entire lifetime of readings before me, including a couple of books by Marissa. Her recipes for an encounter has been an important touchstone for Ashley, Susie, and I throughout the symposium process. Since then, she has written and designed another book about agonism just for the symposium, along with, for good measure, a deck of cards. If you're looking for a disturbingly enjoyable philosophical read about agonism, do not miss her Ballad of Black and Blue in the book, which is also available for free download linked from the Walker website. So Carl does go way back um, to when we were both hacks for the Walker, and we've done many different kinds of projects together over the years, from websites to art projects to theory disputation. So I don't know why I was surprised when I called him to get his usual dollop of advice about the symposium, and he told me he had just finished a book for the MIT Press about design and agonism. Who knew? Uh, of course, MIT Press couldn't name it, uh, wouldn't allow it to be named design and agonism, so it's called adversarial design, but it is available in the, in the bookstore. We're fortunate that the walker is bringing Carl back this summer for a residency on the open field. So today is not your only opportunity to take advantage of his unique blend of pragmatic creativity and thoughtful engagement. There may also be a few seats available for his workshop with Carl Skelton tomorrow morning. So for the past six months, Carl, Marissa, Mark, and Warren have been an informal and dedicated advisory panel, in essence, for the entire symposium. Not only have they helped Ashley, Susie, and I figure out the field of play, so to speak, but they made challenging suggestions and, th and thoughtful critiques throughout the process and were deeply indebted to and appreciative of their support. I'm really looking forward to this morning's conversation. May the best agonist win. Please welcome Carl DeSalvo, Marissa John, Warren Sack, and Mark Shepard. I'm Mark Shepard, and in one minute or less, I'm going to tell you what I think agonism is. Um, agonism, as I understand it, is a productive disagreement that aims less at arriving at a consensus through reducing conflicting positions to mutual commonalities, but rather focuses on fostering dissensus as a way to deepen understanding and tolerance of an other's position. Um, I should say that this doesn't lead to uh, necessarily a resolution. Uh, there uh, potentially is no winner, uh, so I would disagree respectfully or with um, Steve that uh, the, the point is not to win the game. The point is to sustain uh, this kind of struggle to um, understand a position without reducing it to shared mutual commonalities. Warren? So, Aegon is the ancient Greek term for competition 
or contest with the prize. And so agonistic, uh, agonism is an approach to politics that it, uh, it, at a time when consensus is maybe impractical and therefore recast it as a competition. Um, so I'll go into other fields um, and how they're thinking about agonism. So an agonistic muscle is one that re re returns your limb to its natural state as opposed to antagonistic muscle. Um, musicians often translate the notion of an agonism into ideas about syncopation, rhythm, and counterpoint. Um, and um, the entrepreneur John C. Lee Brown, um, who founded Xerox Perks Artist in Residency Program, wrote, wrote about how fostering productive friction improves innovation, profits, and team performance. And um, he spends a lot of um, time thinking or writing about um, how to cultivate productive friction. You need a performance fabric that creates the conditions for anticipating difference. I'm Carl DeSalvo. Agonism is a belief system and a set of practices that at its core are a commitment to democracy not as a rational pursuit, but as a passionate affair. It's a commitment to constantly challenging the status quo and to working to compose new social structures that allow us to experience the world in new ways. I want to begin by thanking Steve and Ashley and Susie, Northern Lights MN and The Walker for putting this on and for letting us come here and have this conversation. Uh, I'm going to start this morning's talk with a little bit of um, background. Over the past several years, I've been interested in thinking about and practicing um, new relationships between design and democracy. And it's that pursuit that led me to the idea of um, agonism and to the idea of developing a critical language and a practice around what I call adversarial design, which at its simplest is a way to uh, understand and talk about work that does, uh, design that does the work of agonism. So the motivation for this really came from two places. One, as someone who's invested um, and interested in design history theory and criticism, to try to understand 
what it is that design does in relationship to democracy. And as someone who's also interested in a different kind of practice and at times a kind of radical practices around design, to understand what the potentials of design might be. So to develop a language that shows us what design is doing as well as to conceptualize what design might be doing. I began by thinking about projects that exist in the world. And one way to understand agonism and one way to understand design and democracy is to look at the range of projects. What you see on the screen here are examples from a project that was done by, sponsored by the AIGA, which is the national governing body of graphic arts. Uh, there was this project called Design for Democracy, Ballot and Election Design. And what you see here is a series of examples of graphic and information design tactics and skills applied to common political problems to which there are known solutions. Right? What we see here, we can understand what's going on here. We're applying things like color and type and information hierarchy to make voting easier. But I found this disturbing. Right? The question is, is this all that design can do? Is this really engaging with the kinds of politics and political actions that we need to engage? At the same time, we see this. We see projects like this. This is a project from Laura Kurgan uh, from the Spatial Information Design Lab called Million Dollar Blocks. What Kurgan did was she looked at, she used geographic information systems and looked at patterns of prison incarceration around the country and found that there are blocks, city blocks, in which over a million dollars a year is being spent to incarcerate the residents of that block. Kurgan's project doesn't solve an existing political problem. Right? It doesn't solve the problem of prison populations or incarcerations. What it does is it acts to bring it to the surface, to provide us with evidence so that we can challenge it, so that we can contest it, so that we can use it as the basis for debate, to use it to foment new kinds of action. But it's a very different kind of engagement with design. It brings up and it brings to the fore the need to make a distinction and to understand the distinction between politics and the political. Politics, particularly in theories of agonistic discourse, politics are the means of governance, right? They're the ways in which, we, in which the government gets done what it needs to get done. The political, in contrast, is a condition of life. Right? It, is, it is about the ways in which people relate to each other or the ways in which people might relate to each other. We can understand this as a difference between what we might call design for politics and political design. Where design for politics is what we saw in the first example. Design for politics is the application of existing design skills to known problems in governance. Political design is something different. Political design is the application of design skills to trying to get us to recognize the status of contestation, of conflict, of struggle that is the sign of a healthy democracy. This brings us to the idea of agonism. This idea of agonism makes the claim that democracy is not to be found in consensus, but contestation. A healthy democracy is not when we all agree, but when we can all productively disagree, and in a way that we do that ongoing and forever, giving up any of those desires that we have that any conflict, any situation will ever truly be resolved. We see that in these examples again. We see that when we think about the difference between consensus and dissensus. The idea that design for politics strives to enable, con strives to achieve a state of consensus, whereas political design strives to enable us to engage in dissensus, in disagreement, in the refusal to come to the kind of solution that's often brought about by rote agreement. Design applied to politics is a kind of design work that we're familiar with. But I would argue it's a kind of design work that has run its course. We need to think about doing more than this. We need to ask the questions that are not being asked by this kind of design work, but that are being asked when we think about design as a political provocation. Design for politics assumes that voting is a solution. It assumes that voting allows us to move to a new place that's better. Political design doesn't make that assumption. 
in Kurgan's work, we don't see an existing, don't see a support of a, the existing status quo. We see a questioning of it. She doesn't provide us with a solution, but she provides us a way to ask new questions. That is the crux of what political design is about. That is the job of what it means to do adversarial design. What we need to begin to think about as design critics, as folks who are involved in day-to-day -day design practice, are identifying the ways, or what Steve has termed, the architectures by which this kind of work gets done. There are languages that we can use to describe this. We have the languages to describe common forms of design ap applied to politics. We know how to talk about legibility. We know how to talk about ease of use. We need to begin to develop vocabularies and ways of talking about and critiquing the kind of work that political design does, the kind of work that has to do with framing issues, the kind of work that has to do with enabling dissensus, the kind of work that has to do with articulating collectives that allow us to take new action. That's a job for us as design critics and scholars. As design practitioners, we have to think about how do we design things? And the form of those things don't necessarily matter, but things that allow us and allow other people to investigate, to act out, whether in play or other forms, conflicting values and belief systems that allow us to model new forms of social relations that might suggest more equitable, more just ways of living. These are big things to try to think about. Over the past several years, in addition to the sort of theory and criticism work that I've been developing, I've been exploring these ideas in my practice in a variety of ways that have to do not so much with creating artifacts, but with creating events, with creating toolkits and workshops, for example, that allow people to go into their communities and engage in environmental monitoring and sensing to challenge the ways in which public health is recorded, to challenge the ways in which uh, who has access to these sorts of technologies, who gets to measure their environment and comment on it, developing workshops that bring together, for example, small-scale farmers and other food producers to look at the ways in which robotics and automation are used and within their community, to participate in the idea of being involved in the invention of new technologies that in some ways challenge their values, and building uh, labs and systems that allow people to come together. This is an image from Zero One San Jose last year that allow people to come together to engage in design activities themselves, to participate in inventing new forms of action. That's a robot balloon for seed bombing. It's these kinds of activities that we need to be encountering, that we need to be thinking about developing as we think about what we should be doing as a kind of adversarial design, as a kind of design that takes the challenges of agonism seriously. At the same time, I want to end by saying that we need to have some humility, something that the design field um, has very little of uh, and is a constant problem for it. This is an image taken from Occupy Wall Street in New York. I think we need to be careful to recognize that there are some things that we cannot design, that there are some things that we should not try to design. I'm not convinced that you can design this. I am convinced, however, that you can think about what it means to design for this. What are the kinds of social, what are the kinds of structures, the infrastructures that we can create to support new kinds of radical social practices? Not where we try to take over the social practice itself as some sort of total design vision, which consistently has failed for the last century, but the ways in which we might think about design as a service, a service not to corporations and governments, but a service to issues and a service to publics. What does it mean to design for these sorts of actions in communities rather than trying to design them outright. By way of conclusion, then we come back to this question about why agonism, why adversarial design? My argument is, is it provides us a way to understand what more design might do in relationship to democracy. That the idea of design applied to politics, simply improving the usability or the beauty of our existing means of governance is no longer enough. What we need to do is to discover, to invent, and to critique new ways to think about design that bring us into new social conditions and relations. Thank you. So 
I didn't introduce myself earlier. I'm Marissa. And thank you so much to Ashley, to Susie, and to Steve for making this happen. Um, so um, I was going to talk through some examples of my work, and then it's going to meander and end up in a conversation about the protagonist book. I've been thinking about um, the media theorist Mackenzie Wark and how he writes about how games provide a vehicle through which the player confronts him or herself and how, um, and, uh, and through otherness and also how game space is essentially featureless and is a space of boredom. Um, and um, that what pulls together the player through the game is the act of targeting which provides an object to a game. So targeting provides an arc or a telos to the game. And I've been thinking about Work's words of, as I've been working on a project um, that's an ongoing project called El Biblio Bandido, which means story thief, roughly in English. And this is a project that grew out of a series of workshops. Um, well, I had been teaching K through 12 bookmaking and literacy in San Francisco for um, a number of years, and a friend of mine, um, she had been doing community development work in this small rural village in Honduras, and um, she approached me and she said, you know, uh, the people there are so excited about literacy, the schools are, um, you know, they're kind of terrible, um, really shoddy infrastructure, but people are really hungry about um, literacy and reading. And she said, you should come to El Pital and do a workshop there. They have the largest library in the whole region. So, um, so I got there, and the size of the library was about this big, and there was something like 32 books. So um, there I was leading a bookmaking workshop. And um, you know, the kids loved it. They spent their whole week doing this. And they spent, you know, in the evenings, they'd go home and teach their mothers and their grandmas how to make these books. And so then the question was how to continue this workshop in a kind of more sustainable fashion, and also to bring um, these classes and this workshop and this fervor to other villages and towns outside. So um, the size that we're talking about is El Pital says that they have 400 residents, but it feels like 121. Um, so um, I went down there and I, uh, you know, again, and I was working with the library committee and we were thinking about this question about sustainability and um, we decided to continue it at, by creating this living legend. So. Um, this is the legend that we created. Um, you might have heard about mobile libraries in the backs of camels, trucks, horses, or even the infamous Biblio Bandido that rose around rural Colombia. But in June of this year, in El Pital, a, uh, a masked bandit calling himself the Biblio Bandido ambled through town in broad daylight, mounted on a burro. Onlookers screamed, smiled, and ran to hide. And during the monthly story hour, a group of kids discovered that the modeling character left a notice in the library, on the library door that said, I am El Biblio Bandido, I am ravenous for stories, and stories give me my sustenance, those that don't feed me beware. And so I turned to the group of kids that were gathered with me by the side of the road, and I said, you know, this guy is horrifying, and he's terrifying, and we don't want him to come back. So we had better start writing stories, and we just happened to have bookmaking supplies here. So uh, we got to work making these Biblio Benidos themed books, such as um, oh, this is the such as this menu. And um, uh, another example of his, of a book is um, I asked him to imagine, you know, this guy he eats all these stories, right? The Pinocchio, Cinderella, all these stories, um, all jumbled up. All these characters are all jumbled up in his stomach. So you know, your story is to think about what these characters are doing. Are they having a tea party? Are they waging a war against each other? What's happening inside the stomach? So that was El Estomago del Bilu Bandido. So um, in order that they, to be spared from this guy's appetite, when you wrote a story, you'd write your name into this book um, so that he would know who had made their offering. Um, and felicitously, the cops showed up, which demonstrated to the community in El Pita that um, the guy was really a threat and that, in fact, he was real. And the cops actually never show up for anything. Um, so this um, validated that. 
Um, and um, the cop had interviewed a few people, and um, the kids who'd been um, making these mug shots of, well, not, not mug shots, but these drawings of um, recollecting what the guy looked like offered them their drawings. Um, and they also made spaghetti western style warning signs um, to put up in the surrounding forest and jungle to warn other people. And um, these are the warning signs. And so we went to the surrounding towns to warn um, other people of this character. And we brought with us our photos. And we said, did you guys hear what happened in El Pita? And they said, no, what, what happened? And I said, well, this guy, he came through town on this borough, you know, duh. But we brought bookmaking supplies. So um, over the course of the next few weeks, um, the bandito became a superstar and copycats became, uh, began cropping up around the region. And there was uh, many Biblu Bandido sightings. And um, so um, since 2010, when we were working on this, um, the El Biblu Bandido became the mascot of the special ed school. Um, and um, the character has been taken over by different groups of people. It's still the main character, but he now he has assistant Biblu Bandidos. And every third, the third week of every month is Biblu Bandido week. Um, and so um, I'm going back there to document um, what's the evolution of the project. And really what's been fascinating to watch is the way that the legend, this thing works because of this agonistic kernel that follows this Santa Claus logic where you have to perform in order to avoid a terror. Um, so the agon provides a scaffolding around which people can play, improvise, and perform. Um, this is a project um, I have been working as an artist embedded in um, different kinds of groups for a number of years. And I was working in a place called Street Vendor Project of the Urban Justice Center. And we were working this campaign where um, a council member on the Upper East Side, Jessica Lappin, was trying to pass a bill where if you were a truck vendor, you and if you received more than three tickets per year, you would have your, uh, your permit revoked. And it's common that if you're a truck vendor that you receive you know, three tickets a week, for example. Um, and so she was working in concert with a lot of the business improvement distri districts and corporations up there to criminalize uh, street vending. And so um, you, know, you can do the thing where you have the petition, you have people sign it, but uh, you know, I suggested with sneaking in artwork into the campaign, and I said, well, why don't we just design a ticket that looks like the ones that street vendors normally get? And there's a performative element built in where you can, for example, hand them out to people on the, on the sidewalk and pretend like you're giving them a ticket. And so um, there's this built-in uh, mediagenic quality to it. And uh, we actually got a ton of press related to that project. And um, the bill was defeated before it went to the hearing um, because of the negative press attention. And this, we showed up at the hearing and gave um, the council member um, a stack of 500 pink tickets. And um, this is uh, the picture from the New York Times where she's, quote, giving us points for creativity. So um, I was thinking about this project. Also, there was a question yesterday uh, in this discussion about um, when you're doing something, a kind of intervention or this agonistic gesture, what is the role or obligation in art in ensuring continuity and how does it turn into policy? And you know, and my sense is um, that <clears throat> for that kind of structural change to happen, you really need to rely on the expertise of others and um, the function of artwork in this kind of case is to provoke and prod and, and show the way towards and make something happen that might not otherwise be possible or be harder. <clears throat> I'm going to skip this project. Um, and uh, I was thinking about and looking at um, the work of artists embedded in industry, uh, business, uh, corporations, and electoral politics. Um, and um, I put together this book where I was looking at these practices happening today and also um, these examples as they cropped up in the late 60s and 70s during this kind of utopic moment. And um, so, um, uh, Artist Placement Group is a 
uh, was founded in 1966 by um, Barbara Steveni and John Latham. Um, and it was uh, begun under this premise and this belief that context is half the work. And um, over the course of um, 15 years or so, um, uh, APG placed dozens of artists in corporations such as British Airways, uh, British Rail, National Coal Board, Esso Petroleum, and an intensive care unit. And they always emphasized the critical function of the artist um, in having a different objective and a different time scale than their organizational host. So, um, Emblemizing the agonism inherent in their practice, Steveni recalls this conversation with an IBM executive who said to her, if APG is doing what I think you're doing, I wouldn't advise my company to have anything to do with you. And if you aren't, you're not worth talking to. <laughs> and um, in this book, I was also looking at examples um, of what Larry Bogat refers to as guerrilla electoral politics or artists' interventions into the machinery of electoral politics. Um, this is Mr. Peanut, who's a life-sized tap-dancing peanut invented by John Mitchell and an artist named Vincent Trasov in Vancouver. And uh, Mr. Peanut, Peanut ran for mayor of Vancouver um, in 1974 and won 11% of the vote, which was a testament to the Canadian public's sense of political disenfranchisement at the time, and also the desire for a radical al alternative. So in this, as well as in other guerrilla electoral interventions, each moment of performing the rituals of politics, the debates on television, staged newspaper photo ops, the candidate's act of voting, inherently mocks the other candidates and politicizes the debate. Um, I also think of Janis Janczes' project. Uh, these are three artists from Slovenia who changed their name to Janis Janča, which is the name of the centrist prime minister of Slovenia. And um, what this meant was that every time the artists did something as banal as update their Facebook page, it would send the whole country into peals of laughter. Um, and so they had a number of these provocations which contributed to um, the prime minister not being um, voted again back into um, as prime minister, second round. Um, and I'm interested in a way, in the way that a lot of these embedded artists are using, um, they describe themselves as parasites and um, entering into these um, institutions and um, the way that they're contributing dissonance to make the larger system work faster or uh, function better. And um, this theme is graphically echoed in the book itself in which the footnotes, um, which are the voices of Larry Bogat and myself, um, they begin taking on a life of their own. So um, here uh, we start off at the, as the footnotes and um, then we start interrupting the master text, uh, which is personified by this character called, his name is Narrator. And he's this uh, stuffy and pretentious academic lug. And then the, f the footnotes um, begin a mutinous takeover. Um, and lastly, I wanted to close with um, talking a little bit about the book, um, Protagonist, The Art of Opposition, um, and uh, which brings together the writings of artists, theorists, crackpot CEOs, war and war strategists to present their thoughts about agonism. And um, running through the center of the book is a half inch hole, uh, which is the contribution of artist Steve Shada, who liked the idea that you could peek through, frame the other, and keep them with you as you read along. Um, the book is designed in black and blue, the colors of a good bruise. And the introduction, The Ballad of Black and Blue, is written as a conversation between two characters, black and blue. So in this conversation, I play the role of blue, and my friend Doug Lasden, who's a lawyer and who thinks quite differently from me, is the inspiration for the character Black. And this is what our conversations are like when we get together for a meal, which I enjoy very much because it feels like a great game of tennis and Doug is a worthy adversary. Um, and uh, one time we were playing a game of cards and I'm sure he was letting me win. And I started thinking about how, um, how, much, you, how much time you spend looking at your um, your play of cards while you're holding them in your hand. 
and you're anticipating the next move. So given the relation between agonism and games, I thought it would be fitting to adapt some of the ideas in the book for those who might prefer to play cards. Um, and when you're reading the book or playing the cards, you can't help but notice how much Shada's whole gets in the way of things, <laughs> which reminds me of these two quotes by Chantal Mouffe and Carl DeSalvo that ask us to foreground instead of neutralizing difference. Thank you. Hi, I'm Warren Sack. Thank you all for coming, and thank, uh, thanks to our hosts. Um, Agonistics, a language game, which is what you're seeing play out on the screen right now, is a piece of software that I wrote for an exhibition at the ZKM, the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe, Germany curated by Bruno Latour, Peter Weibel, and our own Steve Dietz. Agonistics uh, recasts an online discussion as a game. One wins points in two ways. First, by engaging others in dialogue. Posts that garner no replies earn a player no points. Second, one wins points by introducing words or phrases that other discussants take up and reuse. Thus, one wins and graphically moves from the periphery of the circle to the center by controlling the vocabulary and capturing the social structure of the discussion. So this design was inspired by the political theorist Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau's articulation of an agonistic democracy and is scored in a way that's akin to how Republican and democratic strategists think about word, <laughs> word crafting and media strategies they devise for campaigners and office holders. <clears throat> so agonistics in some ways is a realistic de depiction of contemporary American politics because it recasts verbal exchanges not as a form of communication, collaboration, and consensus building, but rather as a competition with winners and losers. It's a competition in which the prize is the power to define what is common in our language and what is central to our culture. In other ways, it's not an accurate analog to what we do today. At any given moment in agonistics, a language game, the current winner could change, could be displaced from the center and lose their position to another player. And this is in contrast to contemporary American politics because in our country, the winners use their winnings to tilt the playing field and secure their winning position permanently. Let me list a few of the ways in which the playing field of American politics has been sloped to put the rich and powerful permanently at the top. As my colleague at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Angela Davis, has made clear, prisons are a problem for democracy in the United States. According to the International Center for Prison Studies, the United States has the highest incarceration rate of the world, 743 adults incarcerated per 100,000. More than 1% of the adult population of the United States is in prison, and for particular populations like African Americans, the rate is much higher, about 9%. The US prison population has increased fourfold since 1980. So how can the US be a democracy if a huge portion of its population is locked up and cannot vote? Davis calls this problematic abolition democracy. As we all know, income inequality is another challenge for American democracy. According to the CIA Factbook, the United States ranks as number 100 in the world for income equality, just behind Cameroon, Iran, and Cambodia, and far, far behind Norway, Hungary, and Sweden, which are respectively number three, number two, and number one. So the Occupy Wall Street movement, as well as the super PACs, of the current presidential race clearly illustrate ways in which this inequality has direct implications for democracy. 
Secrecy is another one of our problems. In the recent book on secrecy in American government, Pri a Pulitzer Prize winner and University of California Santa Cruz alum Dana Priest and journalist William Arkin found that 1,271 government organizations and 1,931 private companies work on programs related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and intelligence in about 10,000 locations across the United States, and that an estimated 854,000 people hold top security, security clearances. So in their words, quote, the top secret world the government created in response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, has become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive that no one knows how much money it costs, how many people it employs, or how many programs exist within it, or exactly how many agencies do the same work. So how can we debate what our government does, what it spends its money on, if we have no right to know about many of its actions? Prisons, income inequality, and secrecy are just three of democracy's problems in America. We could create a much longer list that would include, just to name a few more, the undermining of civil rights since 9-11, the estimated 10.8 million immigrants who have no representation in the U.S., the forms of institutionalized corruption in the U.S. Congress, and the deficits in the U.S. education system that make it impossible for citizens to deliberate knowledgeably on some of the most important issues facing us today, including global warming, the current condition of our highways and bridges, AIDS and influenza, genetically modified foods, stem cell research, and a host of other issues that are both politically hot and technically deep in terms of the sophisticated knowledge of science and engineering one needs to understand them. One might say that these problems of democracy are just the result of us seeing politics as a game and playing it that way. But with this symposium, we propose a way towards addressing these deep and distressing challenges of contemporary American democracy by drawing together ideas and inventions from the worlds of art, design, and philosophy. We seek alternatives to the status quo, where I think the status quo really is that politics is seen as a game, a competition. But what is different is what kind of a game is it? As I mentioned, the political philosophers Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau are well known for their writings about agonisms, antagonisms, and democracy. But these ideas have many sources, other sources too. Political philosophers including Hannah Arendt, Jean-Francois Lyotard, William Connolly, Peter Sloterdijk, Bruno Latour, Bonnie Honig should all be considered when we seek to understand just what sort of democracy is an agonistic one. Yet the root of all this diverse thinking is a short essay the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote in 1872 entitled Homer's Contest. The agon, according to Nietzsche, is a very particular approach to contests or competitions in which the overwhelming powerful are, excluding, are excluded. Let me just repeat that. The overwhelmingly powerful are excluded. So Nietzsche says, if we want to see the feeling revealed in its naive form, the feeling that competition is vital, if the well-being of the state is to continue, we should think about the original meaning of ostracism. As, for example, expressed by the Ephesians at the banning of Hermidor, amongst us, nobody should be the best. But if somebody is, let him be somewhere else with other people. <laughs> For why should nobody be best? Because with that, the contest would dry up and the permanent basis of life in the Hellenic state would be endangered. Later, ostracism acquires a different relation to the contest. It is used when there is the obvious danger that one of the great contending politicians and party leaders might feel driven in the heat of battle to use harmful and destructive means to conduct dangerous coup d'etat. The original function of this strange institution, however, not, is not as a safety valve, but as a stimulant. The preeminent individual is removed so that a new contest of powers can be awakened. That is the kernel of the Hellenic idea of competition. It loathes a monopoly of predominance and fears the danger of this. 
So that's Nietzsche talking over a hundred years ago. By the rules of the ancient Aegon, contemporary American democracy is seriously out of whack. The problems we face are problems of establishing a level playing field, problems that exclude potential competitors for no other reason than lack of wealth or because of various forms of racism, problems that include competitors that should be excluded because they're too powerful and leave no one else a chance to win. For example, the Supreme Court's ruling on the Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission case of January 2010, the case that paved the way for the super PACs underwriting today's presidential race, is a good example of how far the United States is from a Nietzschean agonistic democracy, where any contestant as powerful as a super PAC would clearly be ruled as outrageously unqualified as a grenade-throwing, machine-gun-toting team in the National Football League. How much chance how much chance would the Minnesota Vikings have against an opposing team armed with heat-seeking missiles? A well-formed agonistic democracy should disallow any such overwhelming opponents, but American democracy today is besieged with problems that keep it from the ideals of an agonistic democracy. So let's embrace the agonistic character of contemporary American culture, where casinos and professional sports, video games, and a propensity to understand politics and economics as games predominate. By understanding democracy as agonistic rather than deliberative, participatory, collaborative, or representative, we acknowledge the serious differences that divide us. But we need to simultaneously see how our cultural, political, social, and economic institutions do not provide a fair contest or a level, level playing field. They need to be reimagined, redesigned, and reanimated to fix them. Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, first, you know, thanks, thanks again to, to Steve, to Ashley, and to Susie for bringing all of us together. Thanks also, I should say, to um, the fellow panelists. We, there was quite a bit of work which went into leading up to today, and um, um, it, was, it was a pleasure to be able to be included in this group. Um, and I'm not saying that just to try to prevent further attacks later on. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'm going to talk about agonism from the perspective of my work, and it primarily comes from this strange condition I find myself in, which is, um, you know, I was trained, uh, studied, practiced as an architect, and um, at a certain point um, left the profession and um, moved into a um, art practice, which was primarily founded around this kind of um, concern with art and technology, and in my case specifically how it uh, addresses the city and urban space. And so I have kind of embedded in, in, in my, um, my, I guess you would say my job, I, I teach at the University of Buffalo, and I have a joint appointment in two departments. Um, one is the Ar uh, Department of Architecture, the other is the Department of Media Study. And in this very relationship, um, it enables me to take when I'm coming to understand um, as a very agonistic relationship to the profession itself, to the profession of architecture and to the practice of architecture. Um, I'm gonna just let this video run in the background a little bit. Maybe we can bring the sound down. Um, and I, because I think you know, this, this begins to get at um, some of the core issues about this kind of relationship um, between architecture on the one hand, which is traditionally uh, conceived as something which is fixed, which is material, materially based, um, which has to do with organizing social relations, um, economic relations, political relations, and through material means. Um, so on the left, what you have is a video which um, is uh, describing or documenting uh, a, an urban practice called parkour, which essentially is a way of moving through urban space from one point to the other um, as quickly as possible. Um, as you'll see, you have a fairly 
um, <clears throat> gymnastic individual there and taking objects in the urban field as uh, opportunities to perform a, a certain um, type of physical uh, skill in terms of whether it's a jungle gym in this case or whether it has to do with claiming a building's facade as a climbing wall. Um, and the intention here is really to, in, in parkour, which is understood not so much of a game but as a kind of a physical form of exercise, almost a martial art, which has to do with using the urban system and its elements um, in ways which express uh, a certain type of agility and skill, a physical sensitivity to um, the affordances of urban architecture in ways it wasn't initially designed for. <clears throat> so <clears throat> to a certain extent it's a kind of urban hack, you know, I would say. A way of moving through the city which hacks uh, the in initial or original meanings engendered in things like stairs, sidewalks, handrails, and so forth. On the right is a video by uh, an artist, um, the UK-based artist named Chris Oakley. And what it is, is a simulation of a near-future shopping mall in uh, northern uh, Britain. <clears throat> now what I should say is that um, this, is, this is a simulation. Uh, these technologies aren't actually in play, but <clears throat> um, they could be. It's not the technology here which is um, in some way uh, the, the challenge or the problem. Um, in fact, um, what we have really is in terms of the way people and data are entangled and intermingled in so many complex ways is a whole set of policy issues in terms of who can access data, who can share data, and um, who, who, what inferences can be made about you from, from that data. So for example, here you have uh, someone in a clothing store, one's transaction history becomes mined by the system, um, other alternates which one might want to pair with that blouse that she's trying on. Um, later on you'll see uh, seeing in a um, <clears throat> conveyor sushi restaurant where what one is consuming is um, being matched with medical records and a health prognosis is being made about potential for heart, uh, heart attacks um, and so forth. So um, to a certain extent my relationship uh, to this, so on the one hand you have a kind of um, a sort of way of moving through the city, a sort of spatial practice which kind of redefines the elements of the urban system uh, through specific things that people are doing in physical space. On the right you have a condition where you have this kind of information overlay onto physical space, this kind of immaterial overlay onto physical space within which a whole host of transactions and interactions are transpiring. <laughs> so to a certain extent um, I'm beginning to understand my practices in a way trying to navigate the seam between this diptych, which is to say how you move from <clears throat> taking this approach to, to the physical urban system, right? Yes, this dog is wonderful. <laughs> uh, to the physical urban system and apply that to, to the kind of immaterial uh, informatic layer that is uh, becoming increasingly part of our daily lives. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now though is talk about how this plays out in two contexts. One is a series of projects which I've been involved in in terms of the profession of architecture itself, the practice of architecture, um, but um, through a um, series of projects I've done with the Architectural League of New York. And um, the first was a symposium. We, I, together with Trevor Schultz and Omar Khan, organized in 2006. And this symposium brought together people from architecture, design, sociology, comparative media studies, and so forth, um, to look at what happens when architecture is um, in some way brought into a relationship to um, what we define as situated technology. So those technologies which are embedded in and distributed out throughout the material fabric of the city. Um, this led to a series of pamphlet-length publications, which, you know, again, the Architectural League of New York is a professional organization. It's 125 years old, and its membership is primarily composed of professional architects, people who are practicing. So this is not really an academic institution. And it, what it did is, um, you know, the League, in supporting this, enabled a certain type of productive discourse with the profession, right, <clears throat> by people who are ostensibly either on the margins or outside of the uh, profession. 
and really trying to, again, go back and understand what architecture might have to do with the um, whole host of mobile embedded pervasive media communications and informations, uh, information technologies that are increasingly part of our daily lives, in, particularly in cities. <clears throat> This then led to an exhibition uh, that I curated at the Architectural League where um, <clears throat> the League commissioned five different interdisciplinary teams to produce projects which in some way would try to uh, provide concrete examples around which uh, we could have a discussion about um, these, these uh, technologies and what they have to do or don't have to do with architecture. There was a physical uh, hub where each project had a component um, in a gallery space. Then <clears throat> each also had a presence out in the city. This is a project by Natalie Jeremijenko and David Benjamin and Su Yin Yang called Amphibious Architecture, which looked at um, the surface of the waterways around New York City. And rather than serving as a kind of that wonderful aesthetic mirror which reflects the, sci the skyline above, um, became an interface to water, water quality and aquatic life below the surface of the water. <clears throat> um, and so and the, the primary interface here being a mobile phone, which in fact enabled you to text message fish uh, beneath the surface of water and ask how they were doing down there. Um, so as you can imagine, you know, projects like this are, are intentionally provocative to the discipline of architecture uh, through a profession which, or through a professional organization which uh, at a certain moment, at, in fact at the moment of their 125th year anniversary, was looking for ways to extend be architecture beyond uh, the limits of its, of its existing practice. Um, <clears throat> And there was a book then which came out of the exhibition which documents the case studies uh, published by MIT Press last year. Um, now I'm gonna just quickly run through and, I, and the time I have left, which is not much, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk in too much detail about any of this, but um, I'm gonna just briefly introduce a series of projects which um, I produced looking at these conditions um, from my practice as as this, this artist architect, I guess you'd say. Um, this is the Tactical Stone Garden, which Steve referred to as my introduction to tech support, IT support at uh, the municipal level. Um, it's an um, open source software platform for cultivating uh, virtual sound gardens in uh, urban public space. Um, using a mobile software application, you can plant or prune sounds in particular locations in the city, um, which <clears throat> you know, really, um, looks at how you take this kind of immaterial informatic layer and shape it in a kind of collective participatory way rather than through the kind of formal articulation of a space um, and material that architecture is um, known for. This is a project Hertzian Rain, again looking at the kind of wireless topography of urban environments through a kind of participatory uh, um, uh, performance using umbrellas coated with or covered with electromagnetic field shielding fabric and um, hearing sound through wireless headphones uh, produced um, by three audio um, broadcasting, wireless audio broadcasting hubs. Uh, set up to create a kind of zone of interference between them. So I'm trying to understand the kind of conflicted nature of um, interference within this so-called Hertzian space. Um, the last project is the Sentient City Survival Kit. This is a project which um, looks at developing artifacts for survival in Start. the near future so-called Sentient Start. City. <clears throat> so you have a mobile phone application which um, is designed to Find oh, that's not supposed to be happening. Um, a mobile phone application which is designed to help you find something by uh, looking for something else. Or an umbrella called the CCD Me Not Umbrella, which is studded with infrared LEDs designed to uh, enable you to flirt with advanced um, surveillance algorithms running on CCTV security systems. Um, you know, so again, you know, how do you begin to look at these kind of urban systems and infrastructures from a point of view of uh, not necessarily kind of a law enforcement or um, um, business interest perspective, but one which maybe might be produced by more of a sense of citizen engineering. 
Um, again, having to move through these a little bit too quickly, but just just wanted to end by talking a little bit about uh, bringing it back to the physical space of this theater where we're um, performing this event today um, and talk a little bit about uh, these diagrams um, which you're seeing maybe projected on this floor. And the intention here was really to start and how do you think about, if we're going to be talking about agonism and architecture, how do you begin to think about the um, kind of organization of, let's say, furnishings and the distribution of bodies in physical space? In what ways can one, through that organization and the disposition of these bodies and furnishings, um, begin to look at um, the space of conflict? Um, and I began by looking at um, uh, George Balanchine's um, Agon, which is a ballet he composed in, uh, with music by Igor Stravinsky in 1957. And it was a really just beginning with the sort of initial pas de quatre, which was four dancers on stage, looking at how, in a very formal and spatial way, he looked at the relationships between things like um, symmetry, asymmetry, um, um, you know, a kind of sequential versus an um, asequential a movements, and how that might be able to be choreographed in the context of this session. Um, so as you see, these diagrams on the floor are instructing each of uh, us through these different sessions to reconfigure our relationships to each other in terms of how we're formally positioned in space. We'll see how well that works or doesn't work. Um, okay, thanks. Tweet Choir. Some of you know I'm Susie Bielak, and for the moment I am the Mama Tweet. I want to draw all of your attention to these little slips that I think Steve already pointed out. But we're going to give you guys a couple minutes now. I know it has been an incredibly rich morning. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, Tweet Choir. You are going to have an opportunity to have your words translated into song. So the choir is going to give us a kind of sound bed of inspiration. And for anybody who's interested, we're going to have a little moment of meditation or writing for, you know, maybe three minutes. You'll have some music and then there will be transformation of your words into song. Uh, part of this morning is really to engage everybody in the house and bring your voices into the mix, which we'll do with the choir and shortly with Marissa John. So, music and if we can have some house lights so folks can write. No, we'll collect tweets collectively when we're done with this.
sweet riding now. Ushers will collect them, and we might sing them. Thanks for participating in our tweet choir. Please put your pencils down. It's a tweet, not a tome. <laughs> if you're a straggler, we'll come to you later, too. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to lead you in a few minute exercise um, about agonism. And so I have been playing this game at the water cooler at work or, or at dinner parties or on the bus or wherever. Um, and I go, okay, agonism is about mutual incitement or struggle. So um, uh, antagonism is to enemy as agonism is to adversary. And you want a good adversary to have a, game of a good game of tennis, for example. And then I go, when I say agonism, you say blank, OK? So um, I'm going to throw out a few responses that people have um, given to me, which have been wildly different. And it's a kind of fascinating Rorschach test. And, um, and then you go, OK? So um, I was talking with a friend of mine who's a shrink. And she was saying, well, she's a marriage, marriage counselor. And she was talking about how and she said, well, I think about John Gottman. He's this uh, relationship theorist who talks about the strength of a marriage is um, how well disagreements are aired. And he categorizes kinds of conflict in um, marriages, conflict validating, conflict escalating, et cetera. It's kind of fascinating. Um, uh, then someone else said, oh, well, I think of uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, who writes about games. And he says, well, um, agonism occurs um, between games, and also it, incur it occurs uh, within the roles of games. So for example, if you're the player of a game, you have a different set of objectives and a different thing that you're doing than the game master. And there's conflict between those two roles. However, he also says that you can supersede your role and you can um, switch. And so some, you know, it's interesting to think about, well, is that how you actually win the game? You, you switch roles. Uh, one person said, I think of uh, Moby Dick's, uh, you know, well, Moby Dick, and um, the struggle between um, Captain Ahab and the white whale. Um, someone else said, I think of John Milton's Paradise Lost and this tumbling of um, uh, the angels. Um, and um, one musician said, well, I think of counterpoint and um, syncopation and rhythm. And an artist said, well, I think of uh, Lucio Fontana, who's an is a artist who would take a canvas and his, um, he would slit it. So there's a hole in it, like a kind of flap. He's kind of puncturing this um, picture plate and um, art history symbolically. So here's how we're going to play the game. Um, I'm hoping that uh, rather than, so rapid fire or uh, as I say, popcorn style. So like everybody all at once or one person, um, not as in you're, wait, you're, wait, you're raising your hand and you're waiting for someone to come around with a microphone. Not that kind of time delay. This is not that game. This is, you know, um, shout out your response. Okay, so when I say agonism, you say... Fun. <laughs> the opposite of Downton Abbey. The opposite of what? Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey? Okay, okay. Okay. Challenger. Interesting. Balance between stressful and engaging. Balance between, in case you guys didn't hear, balance between stressful and engaging. Okay. Perpetual frustration. <laughs> There's a scene from Dr. Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> the balance of cooperation and competition. Finding a balance. Or finding, I, so um, finding balance and also finding someone to kick you in the butt and then finding balance from that. Potential for growth. 
essential for growth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pardon? So there was something from up there? Uh, a friend of mine who's a lawyer, um, what came up for him was the American adversarial legal system, where in, in our legal system, um, if you are the defender, then your obligation is to defend the, the accused um, at whatever cost. And then if you are the prosecutor, your job is to deliberate between the evidence is, that is being presented to you and on the other hand, um, larger notions of um, justice so there's an asymmetry there, actually. And it's in this um, adversarial system that um, it's believed that we arrive at um, the interpretation or application of or iteration of justice for that particular case, which isn't the case for other legal systems. And I, I thought it was interesting. Um, any last examples? Yeah. Essential. Essential. Essential for resolution. Essential for resolution. Alchemy. Sisyphus. Sisyphus, yeah. Sisyphus. <laughs> Basic critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Being able to take the undermining of your position with grace. Mm. The ideal, at least, of the idea of countervailing forces within government, that there's like different checks and balances set up so one can never get out of mm -hmm. balance. Mm -hmm. Checks and balances uh -huh. within a system. Creative destruction. <laughs> um, why don't we end it there? Thank you, guys. So now here's where we have a conversation. Um, only we all agree about agonism. So what? <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> um, are they allowed to? Because then you guys get to pick us apart a little bit later. Yeah, that's next round. First, we tweet, I think. Why? Agonism is not a term for Minnesota nice. So ah, okay. I don't think so at all. Uh, what, is, what is Minnesota nice? Well, I'm not going to somebody who spent here. six years. I, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder, I mean, this term game has been used, right? The gamification of agonism. And you know, I know it's something which comes from its sort of original definition in Greek, right, in terms of contest. But I wonder if it's, to the extent that games always imply a winner and a loser, or often imply, let's say, a winner and a loser, I wonder if it's actually something, and something which is so useful as a, you know, as, a, as, a, as a model when thinking about democratic processes. I mean, there is this discussion about um, ostracizing uh, 
you know, the 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 winner, right? Or the you know the person of such incredible prowess that we couldn't possibly compete, right? Um, but you know, I'm very much interested in this notion of or see, way of seeing agonism as a process, as a continual process which doesn't necessarily resolve itself. And I guess I'm conflicted because I don't understand how, and you know, maybe in some ways, you know, there are sort of game mechanics, right, um, which which address that as an ongoing process. But I mean, you know, I wonder, I wonder if we might try to kind of challenge this question of gaming. Right? It seems it's something that everybody's referring to as a, you know, a, you know, agonistic democracy as a game. And, and indeed, Chantal Mouffe references that, but she qualifies it. Right? She talks about it as a kind of quasi-game, a mixed game, I think, is the phrase she uses. Um. Um, I've been thinking about, yeah. Um, uh, so I was mentioning, for example, Leotard, who talks about, OK, well, you can supersede the roles within a game, and you can kind of take over or maybe even win, as your game suggests, Warren, um, by code switching or role switching. Um, and to me, still, what's uncomfortable there is that it still has this deterministic ring to it. It still presumes that there's a structure there and that it's inescapable. And um, I was thinking about um, different people who talk about, or anthropologists who talk about play, or philosophers who talk about play, um, of which games is a particular kind um, of play. Um, and for example, uh, the Dutch theorist um, Johan Huizinga writes about um, how for play to happen, you, it has to be temporally bounded, and you willfully know that you're taking it on. You're taking on play, which um, starts um, a little bit of opening up how it is that we can think about agency, individual agency within in creating games and those rules. Um, and then I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about Hans Gadamer, who um, writes a lot, and I think interestingly, about how um, the feeling of play is really that you're making up and discovering the rules as they go along. So it kind of switches the conversation from thinking about this deterministic way in which we're thinking about the rules and how we supersede the rules to thinking about, um, no, 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 the rules are, um, the sense of play happens in this kind of like, um, jouissance, this kind of enjoyment occurs when you feel or have, when you understand your own agency in interpreting and the kind of um, um, improvisatorial function or agency that you have in creating those rules. Hmm. Um, I, I also was interested in how you guys are thinking about um, games and, and rules and mm. um, the element of agon. I, I think if we, if we look at um, some of the really interesting writings about uh, gaming and, and games uh, that are coming out today, like Jane McGonigal's book uh, last year was a New York Times bestseller just called The Reality is Broken. And she, her idea is that games and the idea of games um, can be taken into many different areas, uh, um, democratic participation included. Ian Bogost uh, has a nice little book uh, called How to Do Things with Games. Um, so these are, these are people who know a lot about video games and, and things like that, but, but other games as well. Uh, books like Mary Flanagan's book, um, I'm, not remembering the, na the name of it right now, but she does a whole history of games, takes them back to, especially through the history of art. What's interesting about this, though, if we, if we look at uh, McGonagall's book, um, she explicitly excludes competition. She says, this is not about competition. Um, and if you look at Ian Bogost's uh, book, he, he, ha he does not have a, a chapter on uh, competition or, or contest. He has a chapter on practically everything else, hmm. uh, but not but not that. I, I think, um, so I think what we're talking about in ter in, when we talk about agonism is a kind of game, but it's not necessarily uh, fitting within the contemporary discussion about you know, what are games, what's the role of, uh, of, of video games in t contemporary culture, and how are many things being made into a game, gamification, right? Uh, it, it seems to, to fall somewhat outside of that. I, th I think uh, what 
is, is getting lost is, is how the framing happens. So Huizinga talks about a sort of a framing. Um, it's it's a supposedly if you you walk on to play the game, um, you know you assume you have a, a level playing field and you can just engage in the game. But I think what a lot of what you all were showing today was how the game gets framed in some ways, and that that seems to be a really important part for um, for this this whole discussion, in, especially in terms of art and design. How does the game get framed in a way that's, that makes it fair, that allows everybody to play? And if indeed it is a competition or a contest, you want to make it, you want to frame it in such a way so that anybody uh, who's who's not one of the most powerful uh, has a chance to win, right? Um, but not win forever. I mean, I guess that was the point of my comments. Like, it's, it's not agonistics if somebody can win and win forever. You win for a moment, and then you put yourself back in. Yeah, I really don't like the use of the word game. I really don't like games, actually, at all. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I try not to use that, and I, I think that the game, there, there are some folks that are doing interesting work. There's a fellow, in, a student in Copenhagen, Doug Wilson, who's making games that make people uncomfortable. And what's interesting is he's gotten really negative pushback from the game studies community um, because the point of this is not to make it, you know, it's really to, and, and puts them in very vulnerable um, positions, vulnerable for them, vulnerable for the audience to watch, which makes it very interesting. I think that, um, and I don't want to talk too much, and I don't want to keep using the word game because Marissa's racking up all those points. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that Jay McGonigal's work is like, yeah, don't, you don't even want to look, don't. It's really bad for Mark and I. Um, I don't even want to uh, You know, Jay McGonigal's work is an example of what I think right. is really deeply problematic. This, uh, this idea of, of um, we can make these simulations that will allow us to explore these things in ways that are safe and really happy. Like, the, her book is really should be a book about happiness. Right. Um, and and, uh, and I, we need to move, I think, away from that. So the word play is nice. The other word that, that once you start using the word play that comes up that's interesting from a design and architecture perspective is prototypes. Right? Mm -hmm. So prototypes are a way of doing serious play about what different objects, environments can be. And I think thinking about agonism one of the structures of agonism being the prototype or the activity of modeling um, gets us away from the G word. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it seems we arrive at uh, games through adversary. I mean, you know, if we, for a moment, we step back and we say there's contest, right? Uh, there's competition, right? Uh, there's adversary, but there's, does, does that necessarily lead to game, right? And you know, I think it's important to really differentiate it from notions about gamification, for example, that marketers are you know, appropriating as ways of thinking about ways people live in cities, right? So what if your city is Grand Theft Auto, right? Um, but at the same time, there's this, I mean, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to um, you know, agree with Carl in, in, in this sense that the, um, uh, this, this, question of play um, starts to imply a kind of playing field and also a playbook, right? You know, which is, you know, that, that there is somehow in, even in agonistic discourse, right? Which is, there, there needs to be the assumption, there is, and maybe this goes back to what Marissa is trying to understand about rules, but there needs to be some kind of, you know, shared understanding that, you know, you're not an enemy, but you're an adversary. And in that, you know, is both a kind of um, responsibility for me not to just respectfully agree, but actually through the process of agreement or disagreement, that we can arrive at a consensus, which produces, you know, perhaps you know a greater tolerance or at least empathy for someone else's position. And I, I knew I needed to get some points too, so I used those two terms. But I'd like to introduce the, you know, this, that flip side, right? The other side is tolerance, empathy, and that in play, there is that, right? There is something, you know, whether it's about a competition which results in a winner for all time or temporarily. Um, 
you know, that it's that the result is not winning, but the result is kind of is it a mutual understanding, a deeper understanding, a tolerance, or just a better understanding of your own position in the sense that you have to defend it repeatedly? I I, I don't know if I, w I want to disagree with that, but I, I would bring out uh, Carl's distinction between uh, design for politics and political design. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, the, the question uh, in making that very distinction is uh, what's the connection between the two? So if we can say, oh, yeah, there's a kind of politics where really what we're going to do arrive at is um, a, a disagreement, but it will be, you know, we'll be both satisfied with that and we'll understand the other person's point of view. Fine, but when, um, if, is, is that mean that that's a kind of uh, amusement we play off to the side? Hmm. And when we come to electing a president, when there's only going to be one president, or we come to like uh, negotiating a budget. Uh, for our state, you know, some people get money and other people don't. There are definitely winners and losers. Um, and so I, I think uh, the, it, it, it seems there's a kind of distaste, uh, especially in, in art and design world, for doing uh, design for politics as though like that, that just, we'll, we'll, we'll build something over here that's that's fun and and uh, in the in the end, it isn't going to have any implications for that. And I think that's mm. a serious problem. Mm. Um, what's the connection between? Wait, the what's two? the fun thing that doesn't have any implications? Well, I think the 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 question is so. A thing I, I talk to my students a lot about because we tend to think about well, how does public space and public discussion take place? online. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you, you, you see, for example, the agonistics game, there was a whole bunch of people engaged with the discussion up there. But the, the real question is, um, what are the implications uh, for that for, 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 let's call it government rather than uh, design for politics, design for, for government? Is there, is there any implications for government? And I think a lot of times there there is not. When you scream sure. in cyberspace, nobody hears you in Washington, D.C. Right, or no one cares. Um, I, but I think that there can be implications, so I, and, and if there had been more time. So I think that, for example, I talked about uh, Laura Kurgan's The Million Dollar Block. Right. right. So you, ident you have these, now there, there are these maps that exist right, that you can point to and you can say, this is a phenomenon, right? and here's the pattern for that phenomenon. And that can actually, I think it has, it has one. It, it raises an issue that we can then have policy debates about, right? And and I think doing well, that. Well, that's a really good example because th those have uh, for New York legislators. I yep. think those actually uh, engage them. Yeah, for yeah. New York legislators, for community organizers. Uh -huh. I mean, th that's a way of saying. But but there's an important difference where that problem wasn't given, right? So with the ballots, the problem was given, right? Right. Right. And and I think it's a difference between. Is the problem a given problem, or is the problem or condition discovered? In my mind, the question isn't so much, so I don't see that as um, necessarily inimical. Or um, The question to me is how, how to close the loop between those two processes, right? Um, so that the, the, those engaging in, um, um, and maybe I'm coming up with like quicker rapid prototype style uh, or kind of punchier um, ways of thinking through a problem using um, other methods um, aren't self-ghettoizing or self-marginalizing and how does it, the, the question in my mind is how to um, politicize a process by which that conversation then influences and becomes and is able to fortify or reinvigorate Policy. And I'm also thinking about um, uh, what William Connolly was saying, political theorist, who writes about, um, who's kind of giving some historical context to these debates about agonism. So he says, okay, at, you know, on the one hand, there's groups um, perhaps best emblemized by Chantal Mouffe, who's talking about agonistic democracy. And um, what a second group, which he refers to as you know, more liberal Democrats, will say about the first. Okay, well, that's great. Um, and that what we see, what you guys are doing there is really important. However, 
in this attempt to preserve um, individuation and different perspectives, um, we can't necessarily let the exceptional cases compromise decisions about the larger whole and what's just. Because if we do, that's, it's, we're just gonna have endless process debates and never get anywhere. Um, and then the first group is saying, to, says to the second group, okay, well, yes, but what you're trying to do, you see, in kind of squashing difference is you're neutralizing the debate and it becomes, again, this kind of same old um, status quo. So what Connolly's proposing to that is he says, okay, well, what we need to do is politicize the pathway and think about those spokes or those channels by which we have those conversations. Um, so I see the conversation as those two categories that you are presenting are not inimical. The question is, how is it through pedagogy or through outreach or through design um, create opportunities for which those ideas in the first group are represented and enacted on a kind of structural level to advance democracy or change or whatever it is that you're. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would also say at least that distinction for me is partially uh, it's useful where I'm situated. So if you go and you talk, I would argue, if you go and you talk to professional designers, if you talk to the professional design organization, they're actually only interested in design for politics. Right? Mm -hmm. The political design discussion isn't there. It's the same thing, um, you know, we have, there's these movements now about um, computing at the margins or humanitarian systems or these terms are getting thrown around about new forms of technology, uh, information and communication technologies for development, like, like these sorts of terms it never engages the political. It's always about how do we improve voting? How do we do, um, how do we deliver this right. information, right? It's never, how do we actually question what the underlying structures are, structures are? How do we provide platforms for people to do that? And so I think recognizing that there's this distinction is the first step towards being able to act on doing both. Yeah. But I mean, don't you think at the same time that there's also, you know, in, the, there's <clears throat> ways of using existing platforms um, toward these ends? And I, I, I disagree that there's this notion that if you shout in cyberspace, Washington will never hear you. I mean, we know in just in the last six months alone with the SOPA Act, you yep. know, the massive online, or the defunding of Planned Parenthood, the proposed, you know, there were um, collective, let's say, aggregate voices, it wasn't an individual voice, which did have at least some level of influence in terms of the way um, policy was um, <clears throat> um, made in, in Washington. So, you know, maybe it's not just about designing for politics, but it's understanding, you know, how to appropriate something, which I would argue is a, is a way of thinking about design. Um, to use one platform for another purpose, another aim, using something in ways it wasn't originally designed for. Right? Um. How much time do we have? Because there was, I have something I want to bring up, but I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know how much time we have. <clears throat> I was just going to say, I thought the parkour example was really interesting um, for two reasons. One, it, it actually got, it allowed us to think about how actions can engage um, more than just each other. Right? So parkour is interesting because it's really about engaging the city. Right? And so we see in that it's not just the individual human actor, right? but all of these non-humans get rolled in. So it's suddenly it's the individual human actor, but it's also the engagement with the structure of the city. It's the cars. It's the dogs. Right? So, so suddenly the political field of action is broadened to include more than just the individual human, usually considered rational actor. And I think that that's really important. Mm. It also shows an example, though, of what could be the downside of this kind of work, which is, and this may be getting at what you were saying, it can be spectacular. Right? Mm. And I think we have to be careful about the spectacularness of some of these actions mm. overtaking <clears throat> or becoming the focus rather than what their political valence might be. Okay. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> How do Oh,
like when people have limited perspectives, no desire to grow. Why am I afraid of love, vulnerability, success, joy having to give a shit about a One, two, three. <laughs> Conflict threatens our identities. Our ego, but can also bring deeper understanding. Compassion and new partnerships. This has been great, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, I don't wanna use the G word too many times either, but I thought it was interesting that it came up. The important thing about games is not that they're winners and losers, but that they're bounded. And a lot of what you were talking about is that it's a, it's, um, you, you wanna have an open, you wanna engage people in conflict, but you wanna have it within a bounded set of, you know, you want it to be, um, you know, respectful, and you want to have certain uh, parts of it, but but the reason you have adversaries, the reason the way politics works, which is about allocating power and resources, is because people are fighting pretty hard to get those things. So you could have a nice discussion with your tennis with your friend, you know, you, you who you di who you disagree with, but there's other people who want to just win. Right, and this is how politics works because this is this is how power operates, and this is why we live in the society we do. So the question is, how does agonism, which seems to be about controlling the process but opening up the content, respect the idea that there's going to be people who want to who want to step on your process as well? Right, you're talking about a, a design thing, which is essentially something you control, but. Uh, if you're really creating, if you're really approaching conflict, then people are going to want to uh, um, debate you on process, not just content. So that's sort of the question. So just to clarify, is your question, okay, you guys want to talk about agonism and um, without the, with, with those power players ostracized so that we can have a, but is your question, yeah, but in real life, there is this person, so, and you can't always ostracize them, so what do you do? I, I guess I'm a little confused by your question. No, I think you, uh, let's see, the question is about when you approach, there, there's, um, there are people who don't want to play your game. <laughs> you, uh, you raised a number of, of issues that you thought were the right issues to raise, but I could sit here and say, you, you know, those are all, that, that's not the issues to raise. In other words, I could, I, I, wanna, I wanna win the bill, I wanna win the election, and politics is a dirty business. And um, it's always been a dirty business because there's a lot at stake. So uh, I'm all in favor of a more civil society. In fact, I mean, I do this work too, but um, I wanna recognize that there's people who, are, who, would, who would say, that's nice, and I'm still gonna go over here and chop your knees off to get what makes sense to me as the important, you know, what's important to me. So, does that, is that helpful? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, 
just to take it first. Um, I would respond that I think sometimes an agonistic approach might in fact be achieving the same thing in a more expedient fashion. So I'm thinking about um, the Jessica Lappin project with the ticketing project. It, the whole thing, um, if it were to actually go by the normal civic processes, what would have happened is there would be a debate, you know, or a kind of a hearing in um, the civil courts, and then it gets, you know, adjudicated, so forth. But the role here that art played in that was garnering media attention in an efficient way to then defeat it before it even happened and draw attention and educate the, both public, the public and lawmakers about the, uh, the, the um, uh, its unjust proposition. Um, the Biblu Bandito project is an example in which there are so many attempts by educators to remedy the question of literacy in Honduras, which is the poorest country in Central America. And so then how, how can you design another system, in fact, that um, is trying to solve the same social problems? And in fact, what happened was this like crazy character on, a, on two burrows. Um, and it's that the agonistic kernel of that project, really, that's made it kind of stick. Um, so I guess I would say that they're not necessarily at odds. Well, um, I, I think I do want to talk about games. Um, hmm? I, I think you're always going to have the people who want to play the game that is there because they're winning. Um, but the, 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 the thing that we have available to us as artists and designers um, is actually to shift the culture and thereby change the game in some ways. I think the Biblio Bendito is an example. You're, you're changing the game. Um, and you, when you change the game, um, you rearrange how people can engage. And, and also, um, you, you make it possible for other people to play who, who wouldn't have been otherwise, uh, otherwise playing. So, uh, yeah, you're always going to have the people who are um, who play the power politics with the game that exists. But the the the, the power of being able to shift the culture is um, you build a you build a a different vision about what the game is, and then people. Yeah, you're always going to have people who play outside the rules of the game. But um, that's you know if you shift the the a, a cultural norm. Um, you end up, you end up ostracizing them in some ways because it's just seen as not acceptable. I think the other, it, I don't want to say it's the wrong question, but if you take agonism really seriously, the, the answer would be not only will that always be there, but it should always be there. I mean, the really, I think that one of the most difficult things about this as a political theory for many people is the idea that there's no resolution. Right. And that it is radically pluralistic. So of course, you are always going to have folks who don't want to play the game, who want to play the game by a different set of rules, who have a very different approach to whether it's to, to, um, to resource allocation or whatever your unit of analysis is. Um, and that's just the way it is. Right? And so if it is a game, it's partially realizing like there are different rules here. It's not we can never resolve this situation. And in fact, um, Chantel Mouffe has this great quote about democracy that it's a paradox that we will never achieve it. Right? Like yeah. You can never achieve it because if it's truly <laughs> pluralistic, right, you'll, uh, there will always be outsiders. Someone will always be at the edge of the circle. You cannot have a game in which everyone is at the center mm -hmm. of the circle. And I think it's coming to, to realize that's the structure. Right? That's the political condition that we're working in. And once we accept that, that deliberation isn't going to solve that, that agonism isn't going to solve that, that participation isn't going to solve that. It's just a mess, and it's going to stay a mess. Right? Um, and the question is, how do we act in that mess? Yeah. Um, that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to I mean, pick up on, you just you know, mentioned deliberative democracy, and that, you know, that it's important to remember in Mouffe's essay, that one essay, which we published, or Marissa, Marissa published excerpts of, um, Agonistic democracy is a, understood as a way out of the kind of pitfalls of deliberative democracy, which ultimately is about maintaining a kind of rational um, 
um, debate, right? That there, there's this idea that somehow we can have this kind of rational conversation between us and that it's going to resolve itself in something which, yes, maybe, you know, we don't all, um, you know, fully embrace entirely, but we understand, actually, we've agreed to participate in this deliberative democracy and, you know, we're going to be happy with the sort of results that come out of it, right? This consensus. Um, the, the, the point in this census, and she, she referenced this a number of times, that it, it is factuous. Right? That it does make somebody want to cut off your knees. That that there needs to be a recognition that the the kind of passionate side of debate is um, actually can be a productive side. Right? If it's not reduced to um, you know kind of lowest dom common denominator of shared um, shared understandings. Um, how one addresses this in terms of uh, larger questions about uh, how government's function? I'm not sure. I think it's much more a question of how issues are continually uh, discussed, turned over, turned around, opened up, discarded, that, that, it, that it's a process which doesn't have a resolution and that's the point, is that you know, it's, it's, it's a practice, ultimately. Uh, it's a practice and that's how I see it not being a game. Right? Games have, you know, for better or worse, I know, there we go, another, Another game, yeah. <laughs> game, game, game. Uh, um, we are all losing this game. We have to ostracize Marissa at this point, or at least ostracize games. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to offer a case study to you too. So, um, you know, I have this interest and fascination with embedded art practices and. Um, in particular, I'm interested because actually um, there is this tension between taking um, an artistic practice and how does it become something that's institutionalized or turned into policy or structural change. And I wanted to offer this example of um, there was an artist from Artist Placement Group, that group in the UK that placed artists, and he was in an intensive, I forget his name right now, he's placed in an intensive care unit. And um, what he decided to do was observe the system and, and make recommendations, really. Um, and so he, and he presented them to the intensive care unit and um, you know, they saved something like a couple million pounds in the first year and they continued to enact and implement those changes and they've continued to save those changes and that's a kind of a simple way in which an agonistic gesture or a start, the start of something actually became the, um, once a solution. Um, you know, I also realize that we can change this game if um, those of us who are winning um, repeat quickly um, some of Karl and Marx's. <laughs> um, no, because you have to buy the drinks. So it's fine. I mean, like, yeah, yeah we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're kind of happy this. with this, right? <laughs> <clears throat> I, I'm not, yeah, that's, that's fine with me. <clears throat> no. I think that the problem with the, with the term game is that it's. Um, We'd like to think that we're in this democracy and it's all, you know, we're all, it's all going to work out okay. But what we're really in is an Aztec game or the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. There really are people out there that think that it's more important for them to be able to have a home theater mm -hmm. than it is for people to have health care. Right. There's someone up there. Um, Ricardo Dominguez came here last year to speak at the U and he talked a lot about magical realism in his work and I see that hmm. with your projects too, Marissa. Um, but also when we talk about games, it's sort of taking a, a recognized social form in, in a community, whether it's magical realism or in the US gaming and competition. Um, and, how, and how you can use that Cultural, culturally legible form as sort of a Trojan horse for your oppositional idea. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk about that as like a strategy in s some of your work, or elaborate on why you choose that approach. Um, I, um, well, I actually, uh, I, those of you guys who are here uh, yesterday, or are familiar with uh, Christoph Wojcicki's work, um, know that he talks about um, the role of the the object in um, mediating communication and um, 
uh, there are a few people who talk about the role of the, the yeah, the transitional object that is the, the thing that um, precipitates or accelerates or makes it more expedient a, um, a conversation or goes around or precedes verbal communication. Um, and um, yeah, I think, so thinking about objects and then as a subset of that, the Trojan horse where it's a device for or a lure. I mean, I think in, in the case of many embedded art, artists embedded in other sectors, um, they know that really um, they might be producing an object because there's an expectation in that institution or organizational host to make art with a capital A, but in fact the real art quote for, for, for many of these um, embedded artists is the process itself. Um, yeah. I, I think it's fascinating to look at art as a Trojan horse. Hmm. It's a good question. But I, I think uh, this is, it's, it's really hard to uh, play with games, if you will, as an artist right now because it's so overdetermined in many people's minds what that means because, because it is such a, a huge uh, cultural form right now. I mean, it's, uh, it's an industry. It's bigger than Hollywood, right? In terms of economically, things like that. So, I, but on on the other hand, um, I don't think you want to avoid something like that as an artist because you're you're a culture you're you're a cultural worker. You know, you're you're, you're trying to intervene in that. Um, so it's it's a difficult problem, but I think it's uh, a necessary problem. And I I think the essential issue to to, to figure out is you know what what kinds of games if if you want to work on games as an artist what kinds of games are you interested in and and what kinds of games are you against or trying to work um, against because the we we think when we say game we it, it, people come with the impression that we we all mean the same thing but uh, if we just look at the history of philosophy uh, the, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein used game as something that really has no necessary and sufficient conditions. There is no one definition of a game. You know, what does checkers have to do with uh, playing soccer? Um, you you can start to list these things, but they're a long ways away from one another. Um, especially when we start talking about you know children's games and other things. <laughs> the diversity of that term is is enormous, and I think as a culture we're exercising one little tiny slice of that possibility and that the, the cultural work there is, is to broaden that out and to, to think of other things. I think we should make one last call to the tweet deck. On that note, I want to thank all of you for being present in what really has been um, a phenomenal adventure and exploration. And to let you know that this conversation is going to continue and unfold over the course of today and tomorrow.